have an older sister, Tanya, who's a PE teacher and the volleyball coach at Eagle Crest High School in Aurora. She and her husband actually both play and coach volleyball, and my 16-year-old nephew also plays. So they exist in this volleyball world. It's kind of this foreign world to me. They live in the volleyball world, and it isn't often that their volleyball world and my church world collide. It's only really happened once last month at the St. Louis Convention Center, of all places. The Convention Center, two weeks ago, hosted two separate events in different parts of the Convention Center in St. Louis. Two separate events, the United Methodist Church General Conference and a Boys Regional Club Volleyball Tournament. (laughs) Who knew? I had to go to St. Louis to watch my nephew play volleyball. I was able to watch him at least one match and have a meal with my sister and her family and Even though we were both in St. Louis, really for the most part, our world still stayed separated. The convention center is big enough that we didn't really run into each other. So you had the Methodist Church General Conference and the volleyball tournament, and there wasn't a whole lot that connected us except one thing. One thing throughout the weekend connected us, and it wasn't something I ever expected to create a connection. My sister Tanya texted me when they arrived in St. Louis, And she let me know that the tournament had emailed the teams, the families and the teams, warning them about protests and protesters that they would encounter at the convention center. Thought it was rather sad that volleyball families had to receive an email warning them about protests and protesters because the Methodist church was meeting next door. But it's the way it was. And it wasn't just any protesters, it was Westboro Baptist Church. Many of you, I can tell, are familiar with them. You may know these guys. They are the folks that protest at soldiers' funerals quite often. They hold infamous signs that say things that I don't even want to repeat. I thought about putting their pictures up on the screen while I talked about them, and I don't even want to put a picture of their signs in our sanctuary. What they say to folks, what their signs say, is pretty hard to take. And they stand on corners and they yell hateful and cruel things as people walk by. This wasn't my first encounter with Westboro Baptist Church. When I served Arvada United Methodist in Arvada, they protested us one Easter morning. It was an interesting Easter morning with Westboro outside protesting. I was the low clergy on the totem pole, so I got the privilege, responsibility, assignment to coordinate our response, how we would respond to Westboro coming to our church. I worked with the police department, organized the line. I had to set the line of where they could stand and where they couldn't and what we were going to do and where we were going to stand. But more importantly, I got to organize the hospitality effort because we offered them coffee and donuts all morning long. Nobody ever took it, but we offered. It was an interesting experience, Easter morning with protesters outside. And in the church, we've been trained how to respond, especially to Westboro Baptist, but to any protesters, how to respond. Actually, we've been trained how not to respond. The protesters try to get people angry enough to lash out and to act out or to confront them or even to get in a fight, and then the protesters sue. More often than not, they actually win. Their whole point is to get under your skin. And so we're trained to stay calm, to not react, to not engage, to simply walk past. And the Westboro protesters didn't just stand at the entrances of the general conference. They stood at the entrances for the volleyball tournament as well. And so hundreds of middle school and high school boys and their families had to walk in and out of the convention center amongst protesters who were saying some not very good things. And on the second day, we began to hear news stories or reports, folks who had watched some of the volleyball players get into it with some of the protesters. 15, 16, 17-year-old boys who thought it was kind of fun to egg on the protesters. And then I saw a picture of him, and my nephew was right there in the middle of it. I was actually kind of proud. I wasn't, yeah. But it was risky. 
And, and these 16-year-old guys, they didn't quite understand what it meant to engage these protesters, what the possible consequences might be. And they didn't know that their engagement, their reaction, was actually giving the protesters what they wanted. But man, I understood that temptation to respond. I understood that temptation to fight back and to get into it and to try to tell them that they were wrong, like they were telling me I was wrong. I understood the temptation every time that we walked past them coming in and out of the convention center. And then, I think it was on our second day, I discovered a different response that was unplanned and had an unplanned reaction. At one point, we were crossing the street, and one of the protesters was saying something, and honestly, I can't even tell you what they said, but some of this stuff is just off the wall, and it's beyond reason, and I just laughed. I didn't even mean to. I just laughed out loud, and he did not like it. (laughs) Oh, he didn't like it. And in that moment, the power dynamic shifted. Instead of him trying to elicit this emotional reaction from me, he was reacting. He was yelling louder. He was really telling me that women are supposed to be quiet in church and we're not supposed to have a voice. So I laughed even more. (laughs) And every day when we walked past these protesters, I laughed. And I don't know if it was the best response, and I don't know if it was the healthy response, and I don't know if it was really the Christian response. For those three days... Laughing at the protesters was my own way of not giving in to the temptation to really say what I wanted to say. Because a reaction is what they wanted. A reaction gives them power. The reaction on my part allows them to define the parameters. It's what they wanted. And it's interesting, when we delve into this story of Jesus and the devil, this first story that is our traditional first story in Lent. It's a similar dynamic. A reaction out of Jesus is exactly what the devil wanted. I don't talk about the devil a whole lot. It's usually only the first Sunday in Lent that I really talk about the devil. Scripture actually doesn't talk about the devil a whole lot, but in this story, you can't really delve into it without talking about the devil, because the devil has a major part to play in this story, and the dynamic, the interplay between Jesus and the devil is fascinating to me in this story. The story occurs directly after Jesus' baptism. He's baptized at the River Jordan by his cousin John, and he's immediately led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he doesn't eat for 40 days, and he's tempted by the devil. He doesn't eat anything for 40 days, is what the scripture says. So he would have been hungry. He would have been weak. He wouldn't have been at his strongest, which is often the case. We find ourselves tempted when we're not at our strongest. And the devil tempts Jesus in three ways. First, he says, command the stone to become bread. Show your power, is what he's saying. Demonstrate your ability. And then the devil presents Jesus with the world. All of the kingdoms of the world at his fingertips. And the devil says to Jesus, it could all be yours, all of it, if you simply choose to worship me. And third, the devil took Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem and told him to throw himself off of it, create a situation in which God has to intervene to save him. The three temptations. And Jesus, of course, interacts, but he doesn't really react the way the devil's hoping for. He doesn't quite respond the way the devil's looking for him to. He doesn't argue. He doesn't let the devil set the parameters. Have you ever tried to argue with a five-year-old? Or a 15-year-old? They're about the same. If you engage them at their level, you've already lost. And I love this interaction with Jesus and the devil because he basically treats the devil like a five-year-old. He refused to give the devil any power. He refused to give the temptations any power. He refused to let the devil set the parameters. The devil said, turn the bread to stone. Show your power. Play my game. And Jesus responded, people don't live by bread alone. Why would I do that? The devil tried to make it about power, and Jesus 
just didn't play. The devil said, all the world can be yours. All of it can be yours if you just worship me. The devil said, I can give you prestige. I can give you power. I can give you wealth. I can give you abundance. I can give you the world, literally. I can give you greatness. And Jesus says, it's not about me. Faith isn't about achieving greatness, but about staying humbled in God. The devil said, throw yourself off the temple so God will have to step in. Throw yourself off the temple, Jesus. Force God to make a choice, make a move. Throw yourself off the temple. Prove who you are to God so everyone will see it. And Jesus says, I'm not playing your game. It's not about me. He didn't let the devil, the temptation, have power over him. He didn't let the temptation have power over how he was going to live. He didn't let the devil set the parameters for his living and his faith. It's a powerful story, and it's the story that we begin Lent with. The traditional first Sunday in Lent story, because this story really is foundational. And it's relevant in our lives today. Ever since my girls were young, they would come home upset after school, usually because of an interaction with a classmate. This kid made fun of their hair or their glasses or their lunchbox. This kid was mad because my daughter didn't choose to pick a side on a fight that somebody else was having. This other kid wanted them to behave in a certain way, and they didn't do it. So the girls came home upset, which is understandable, and they would talk about these situations, and almost every time my question back to them was, were they going to let someone else have that much power over their life? Were they going to let their own self-worth, their self-image, their self-esteem be dictated by somebody else? Were they going to let someone else set the parameters for their life? And I think we're faced with these situations, not just in preschool and elementary school, but throughout our lives. And it isn't just people we give power to. It can be things, jobs, ideas, distractions, organizations, fear, grief. I think this might be a small part of what leads to addictions. There are temptations all around us. Do we give them power or not? I think there's a temptation to accept the cultural definitions of beauty for men and for women. There's a temptation to accept the cultural definition of success. Temptations to listen and let someone else define who we should be, how we should look, what we should want, who we should love. The temptation to accept the status quo because it's easier than standing up for what we know to be true and just. And there's a temptation to give up and give in when things get hard. There are temptations all around us, and they're different for each of us. And we can choose to give them power or not. We can choose to engage the temptations or not. We can choose to let them define the parameters for our living or not. We can choose. And we begin Lent with this story because it's our invitation into the season of making a choice. An invitation to face those temptations and choose a different kind of path during Lent. On the tables at the front, you'll find pieces of paper and pencils. This is the type of paper that's supposed to dissolve in water. It's kind of working. We're going to pretend it really dissolves in water really well. The worship band is going to sing. You're invited to come forward and on the piece of paper write down what it is that you've let have power in your life that you don't want to let have power anymore. What's been life draining instead of life giving? What are you giving power to that's, that's not helpful? If you want to give something up for Lent, what temptation do you want to give up? and set your own parameters. Write on the piece of paper, put it in the water, it will dissolve. We're invited to respond like Jesus and to set our own parameters that are based always in God. Amen.